During vanilla, Blizzard built the biggest mapful World of Warcraft ever, spanning two entire continents and more than three dozen zones. It truly was a world to explore. The sheer size of Azeroth and the unknown of what was around the next corner was one of those things that made the game so interesting all those years ago. Sometimes you find a hidden enemy camp, sometimes a new quest hub, and sometimes you take the gate in Northern Redridge into Burning Steps and get a fast track ticket back to the graveyard. Seeing a new environment a cave in the distance or the ever ominous skull level enemy were things that were exciting and kept you wanting more out of the game. But even with the size of the game and how much was planned, Blizzard still had to scrap or delay plenty of ideas. They wanted to do more things than time would allow them to, and eventually certain ideas were packed up and moved into expansions instead of major patches. Today I'm going to be taking a look back at a bunch more of the early ideas of vanilla that never made it into the base game game, exploring what they could have been, and hopefully uncovering some more of the unfinished parts of Classic WoW. But first a quick word from today's sponsor, Everlegion. Everlegion is the ultimate 3D fantasy idol gacha RPG game, where you can collect and upgrade hundreds of heroes from seven different factions in a beautifully designed world. Everlegion offers casual gameplay first, which fits seamlessly into your daily life. You can play whilst watching TV, during bathroom breaks, on the commute, or even during meetings. You can enjoy the satisfaction of progressing characters without having to fully invest all of your free time into it. Everlegion will soon be celebrating its one year anniversary from June 23rd to July 16th and if you log in for 10 consecutive days you'll receive 100 free draws and you can pull incredible heroes like Garzak who will kickstart your team to success. Everlegion features a huge diverse cast of heroes with their own unique stories and effects such as Brenia the Red Wyvern or Ayathil the Blade of Shadows. During the anniversary you can also participate in Melial's favour for a chance to win a complete set of heroes released in the past year and the upcoming one. Explore the Dragon Abyss, a special gameplay mode. Conquer the Dragon's Dungeon on the Gates of Hell difficulty to obtain epic dragon eggs. And challenge the final dragon boss in Pilfer's Blitz for huge rewards. Everlegion has a massive sign-up bonus too as part of this event. Use the unlimited anniversary redeem code ELANIFIRST worth over $100. Including 30 pulls, 500 diamonds, 500k hero XP, 500k coins, 500 crystals and 60 Aranella hero fragments. Many thanks to Everlegion for the sponsor today, let's get back to WoW. In Silverpine Forest, Horde players experience a story of a city that has been saved at the cost of unleashing horrors upon the world. I've been playing through this zone recently with the text-to-speech add-on called VoiceOver, and there is a lot more to it than I thought there was in the past. And Silverpine creates so many stories that are picked up in future expansions, such as Archmage Aragal's resurrection in Wrath of the Lich King, and of course the Worgen race and Gilneas becoming official content during the Cataclysm. The once great city of Gilneas itself is situated in southern Silverpine, and was a big point of mystery during Vanilla. It was one of those big gates to nowhere that teased the later content in the game. Outside the gate, Alliance refugees camped in a sense of hope that one day the gates would reopen, whilst Horde players had to contend with the disastrous decision of Archmage Aragal to summon the Worgen into the world. And during night time, the residents of the nearby Pywood village morph into their truth form. This is one of two areas in the game, that I know of at least, where there are different enemies between night and day, the other one being the graveyard in Moonbrook in Westfall, where there are vultures in the day and zombies at night. As for Archmage Aragal himself, he has retreated into the depths of Shadowfang Keep, asserting himself as the Worgen Alpha and commanding his forces from afar. And during Classic, I feel as though the Horde see near enough their entire side of the story to its conclusion, that being finally defeating Archmage Aragal himself inside of Shadowfang Keep, but Gilneas and the various Alliance outposts serve as mainly cannon fodder for Horde quests, rather than anything actually linked to the Alliance's story within the world. Later, the Grey Main Wall would be shattered by the Cataclysm, revealing the nature of the more humane Worgen to the world, as well as Gilneas. In Classic, the continuation of this story could really go either way. You could have the Worgen regaining their sanity and returning as a race to the Alliance, or you find that Gilneas has been overrun by Feral Worgen and has to be cleared as PvE content. 
Or maybe even Gilneas is something similar to open world city content, such as Soromar was during Legion. There are many different ways this story could go than how it went in Cataclysm, and I know it's all just speculation and stuff that sounds cool on paper, but that's what makes it interesting to me. If there is another big door teasing future content, it's the colossal gateway in Ashara surrounded by Firbolg. Except unlike the grey main wall, this gate remains a mystery to this day. We talked about Ashara a bunch in the previous video, and how there is a certain lack of content to be found there. It's a near enough endgame zone that feels as though it's been forgotten about in favour of more compelling stories in other zones. And if you check the classic map of Ashara, these Firbolg gates have even been officially drawn up onto it. It really all suggests that this place was meant to be something more than what it ended up being. There is even a rare mob that can spawn called Gatekeeper Rage Roar just outside of the gates too. On top of that, the gates themselves go directly into the side of a mountain, almost suggesting that the Firbolg are living under the mountain, kind of like dwarves would. And well, if you look at Timbermore Hold on the Felwood side, we do in fact have a faction of Firbolg occupying the underground, where they've carved out a pathway between Felwood, Winter Spring, and and Moonglade. Now there is something else which I've noticed here. The subzone that the Firbolg live in in Felwood is called Timbermore Hold, and if you stand in front of the gates in Ashara, you also get a subzone called Timbermore Hold. So if we link the dots and use, well, a lot of imagination, we can only assume that the Firbolg have a massive underground empire that goes all the way from Felwood to Ashara, and that these gates were due to be the entrance to it, but it just never got finished and put in the game. Another point to consider here is that the player can become friendly with the Timbermore Firbolg, who have managed to escape corruption, unlike the other Firbolg tribes that we encounter. So maybe it could even be quite a similar situation to Gilneas. Maybe the gates reopen and the Firbolg somehow, some way, become an ally of the Horde. I mean, it's in Ashara, that's quite close to Horde territories. And I'm just saying in Cataclysm, the idea that goblins would fully pledge themselves to one faction never quite made sense to me. Alternatively, the Firbolg have shut off the gates for the good of Azeroth as Timbermore Hold had fallen to corruption and they did not want to unleash the horrors that had been growing there. And in that case, we could have it cleared as PvE content with raids or instances. Either way, we never found out what was behind this set of gates, so it would be cool to see it one day. Next is a feature that was cut from a horde race in vanilla and would kind of make a return to an alliance one in Cataclysm. Planes running. Originally, this ability was what Tauren got instead of a Kodo mount. I guess Blizzard were thinking, how can we find a mount large enough to make sense for the Tauren model, which is fair enough. There were two NPCs we could learn this race specific skill. The quest text from CERN Pride Runner is still available on Wowhead's database, saying that you will be granted the swiftness of planes running. The other place we could learn this skill was from a female Tauren that won the Stranglethorn Veil called Samantha Swifthoof. You've probably seen her on your journeys throughout this zone, and as Alliance, though she does show aggressive, she will not attack on sight, unlike other enemies. Just don't go hitting her for no reason, unless you want a PvP flag. The first version of planes running was seen to be problematic though. While standard mounts took 3 seconds to summon, planes running took 10 to ramp up, and if you stopped or entered combat it would instantly fade leading to this cool idea actually being very frustrating. These limitations were considered in the first place for PvP reasons. I mean, can you imagine a Tauren running circles around people at 100% speed once they gain the level 60 version of planes running? Because that could have been a very hilarious reality. Also, you could not turn planes running off. Once you hit that 10 seconds of running, your cow just entered nitro mode and started sprinting off into the distance. Or maybe into a pack of enemies, or maybe off a cliff. Yeah, it had one or two problems. During the Cataclysm, of course, Worgen got running wild, with a blue post at the time even referencing planes running. Running wild, however, just worked like a standard mount, having a cast time and increasing your movement speed by a set amount. I don't see why the idea for how Running Wild functioned couldn't work for planes running nowadays. I mean, I certainly want to see Tauren randomly sprinting across the world. Another project that was seen very early in vanilla was the Dragon Isles. For a name that's been known for as long as it has, it's amazing that it finally was brought to life in World of Warcraft's most recent expansion, Dragonflight. 
Originally, the Dragon Isles were intended to be a late game zone in the Northern Eastern Kingdoms. There was also supposed to be raid content present for players between levels 65 to 70. This zone and or raid was also supposed to house temples of worships for various old gods that would serve as enemies for players. One of the most popular early pieces of concept artwork shows a fossil or squid-like temple with long tendrils extending outwards. During the battle for Azeroth, the Shrine of the Storm in Stormsong Valley showed very similar artwork to this idea, but just on a much larger scale. And as easy as it is to miss, this kind of artwork itself was included in Classic WoW 2. Well, when I say it's easy to miss, it is if you play Horde, because it's located in Darkshore. There is a subzone called the Master's Glaive, which show off the remains of a huge and ancient battle between an old one and stone giants. Players are sent there to find out what the Twilight's Hammer are up to and to put a stop to them. This quest series eventually carries players over to Black Fathom's Deep to defeat more powerful cultists. The Dragon Isles were cut at such an early stage of vanilla that these days if they were brought back they could really be anything. Also we already have a fight with one old god, Cthun, during vanilla, but maybe we do have space for a second. The next one I have is something that I'm sure nearly everyone's going to know about, but one that I'd like to include in the video, because there was a lot of work put into this area despite it not seeing some form of release as a raid until TBC, and later as a full zone in Cataclysm. I am of course talking about Mount Hyjal. This subzone had quite a bit of design work in place already, and you can visit it in game in Classic, either through a set of tricky jumps or just spam Eagle Eye on a Hunter. That's much easier. It's overall quite a linear zone, with one major path leading from the instance portal up the mountain. There are a number of blank open spaces that have been laid out as foundations for content, and perhaps biggest of all was the World Tree showing Archimon's defeat following the battle for Mount Hyjal. There is also physically an instance portal for Mount Hyjal in the game too, and that's located deep within Dark Whisper Gorge, where you can see the iconic swirly green entrance, suggesting that this zone would have been for a raid but we have a gate just in front of it blocking access. Hyjal is a zone that we have seen plenty of after vanilla, and I'm just gonna say I could happily skip the raid version in TBC in favour of it being a full-on zone in Cataclysm. I could see it being a zone in Classic though for sure. As for what PvE content may fit in here, I feel as though you'd have to come up with something kind of new from what we already have. Archimont has long been defeated in terms of the story of vanilla World of Warcraft, so really the options would be open here. Next up, one of the most captivating stories told in World of Warcraft is that of the Ashbringer, but you really have to dig deep to find much reference to it in the game. Players fortunate enough to get hold of the corrupted Ashbringer from the Four Horsemen encounter during Vanilla Classic can take it over to the Scarlet Monastery to trigger a special event, where Scarlet Crusaders no longer are aggressive. They believe the player is the return of the Ashbringer into the fold. After a rather violent interaction between the Scarlet Commander and High Lord Mograine, the player is able to speak with a redeemed High Inquisitor Fairbanks, who perhaps gives out the most interesting information of this event. He says that the corrupted Ashbringer is beyond redemption, but there is another son of Mograine to be found in the Outland, who has the capability to forge a totally new one. This is of course referring to Darian Mograine, however in the story of World of Warcraft, what Fairbanks says just doesn't happen at all. Instead, Darian briefly joins the Scourge before breaking away after the Lich King's betrayal of the Battle for Light's Hope during the DK starter quest, and he just keeps using the Corrupted Ashbringer instead of trying to forge a new one too. I think a lot of people want the idea of some kind of Scarlet Crusade raid or instance. This conversation with Furbanks could serve as the start of something entirely new. Imagine it is a new late game raid after Naxxramas. You start off by finding the Corrupted Ashbringer from Nax, you have to find Darian Mograine out in the world somewhere, though you may have to change the text about him being an outland a little bit. You forge a new Ashbringer as part of the raid, and what would be a more fitting legendary to add into Classic than a reforged Ashbringer? I mean, you could even get the unused Quell for Last Zone and the Sunwell involved in its reforging too. There is just a ton of lore and story built up in this area that would make sense for vanilla. Again, I'm just throwing out ideas, but there is so much grounds for great content here. 
Next is the zone where there is a big difference between the two factions, the Hinterlands. Now if you are a Horde player, you probably really like this zone and I can't blame you because there is a lot to get done here, elite quests and many great quest rewards that will last you to level cap. On the Alliance, um, yeah, there's not quite so much going on, which is strange because there is a full-on Alliance faction that calls this zone their home, the Wild Hammer Dwarves. In Classic, this is a faction that you can grind all the way to Exalted if you really want to through repeating quests and grinding mobs. It is, well, completely useless though. Seriously, this may be the biggest waste of time faction to get Exalted with. Not only do they not have a reputation vendor, but this faction also gets removed from the game at the start of the Burning Crusade, because, well, it just didn't serve any purpose. The Wildhammer Dwarves will later be brought back during the Cataclysm as a faction to appear in one of the new zones, the Twilight Highlands. It just feels as though there could be something more here than there currently is. Could there be more faction-based quests? Maybe a reputation vendor that sells mount-related items, possibly. Also, the Wildhammer are famous for their ability to fly griffins. Now I'm not suggesting flying or even faction specific flying, can you imagine that? But maybe there are ways you can improve the flight network, improve the speed of it, something like that. There is also a PvP sub story in the Hinterlands too, though it is mainly a horde thing where you're preying on various alliance forces such as high elves and griffins throughout the zone. That's another thing we could talk about. High elves, they are allied with the alliance despite only playing minor roles in the game as a whole. Anyways, there is this one-sided pvp thing going on not sure how much could be added to it because in terms of open world pvp objectives they've been done in both eastern plaguelands and silithus and they have a tendency to be rather dead content due to the rewards not being there in terms of honor gear gold and so on the next one i have is a curious little cave entrance that i think most of us would have seen located just to the west of the searing gorge side entrance to black rock mountain is a small blocked off cave entrance the the reason you'll have seen this quest entrance is probably when you're doing that one quest where you have to kill greater lava spiders. Now this cave is maybe just nothing more than a bit of scenery, or perhaps at some point it was meant to be something larger. The cave perhaps was a link down to the Altar of Storms on the burning steppe side of Black Rock Mountain. The Altar of Storms itself is very rarely visited, apart from players looking out for Black Lotus in the game, and in the lore they used to be places of great power for the Horde. Biggest of all is that this mysterious mysterious small cave even has a name, Black Char Cave. It feels like something was supposed to be here, but it was scrapped. All the same, I do kind of like having to go through Black Rock Mountain as the main way to travel on foot between Searing Gorge and Burning Steps. So these days, this cave is probably just a bit of scenery. Next is a bit of content that feels as though it could have a bit more done with it, and that's regarding the Centaur reputations in Desolus. So if you're a reputation enjoyer, you will know that during class, it's possible to just about get revered through grinding mobs, then turning in quests with either the Gelkis or Magrant Centaur. In BFA, there were changes added so the player can now hit Exalted to open up more reputations for the 100 Exalted Reps achievement. But in Classic, you only get a couple of extra quests after having hit the higher reputation thresholds. What about getting a reputation vendor added with new things the player could get? There's already plenty of choices in professions for picking one or the other, such as Gnomish or goblin engineering, armor or weapon smithing, and so on. What if this was extended to the player picking Magram or Gelkis Centaur as a part of your character progression? You get ammo from one of the quest rewards. Maybe you could have one of the best tiers of ammos being behind Exalted with one of these factions, for example. Or maybe you could add some hunter pet food that reduces the damage taken from AoE so your pet isn't completely useless in raids. Again, just some ideas. Next is a small island which is super easy to miss. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you've walked past it a dozen times and never really noticed it. It's called Purgation Isle just off the coast of Hillsbrad near South Shore, and I'm kind of surprised this didn't end up being cut. Prior to patch 1.10, it was just a bunch of level 20 to 30 mobs occupying the zone, despite there being no quests here. Alongside of the release of the tier 0.5 quests in 1.10, the isle was updated to now include very high 
high-level elite mobs. Even still, the only reason to go there was to farm Soul Ash as part of your tier 0.5 quest. Growing Kata, this isle was overhauled again and made into a small quest area. Perhaps in Classic, Purgation Isle could be used for more than what it is at the moment, maybe as a high-level questing area or a possible place for new items or profession patterns to drop. But there are several other islands that were present in early versions of Vanilla that did not make it into the live game, such as Gilla Jim's Isle or the Isle of Dr. Lapidus. Both of these places were allegedly supposed to be points of interest for questing or leveling players, however they were both cut at some point in time. I think island-based content can be super interesting, and they make for a good natural break between regular questing and having that feeling as though you're going into a more dangerous zone. Perhaps the best example of this to me that did make it into the game is Al Kaz Island. This place ends up being a part of the Scepter of the Shifting Sands questline and the home of a mini boss, Dr. Weevil. Also, Varian Rin himself was held there prior to patch 1.9. He was located in a lower sewer area before being later replaced by a generic named Mob. Maybe you could even bring back the storyline to free the king from the Defiance forces in Dustwallow as part of an alternative narrative. I think if you can say one thing about all this scrapped or cut content is that there's a rather common theme of them being eventually used during the Cataclysm. And though Cataclysm as an expansion ended up being quite divisive among players, I feel as though it did build upon a lot of the ideas presented in early vanilla and could certainly, in parts at least, be used for inspiration if Classic Plus or anything along that line would ever happen. In any event, there is a metric ton of story and potential in Classic that lays beneath the surface. And I know this whole thing is a dream and probably very unlikely, but I want to imagine a game where one day it's possible and we do get to see a whole other side of World of Warcraft. If you like the video and want to see more of its type, I do have a part one of this kind of video on the subject of scrapped or removed content that you can check out. I'll link it at the top right of the screen and in the comments below. It will probably have a lot of the things you would have expected to hear about in this video. If there's anything else you think I can cover around this topic, do let me know below, and who knows, maybe there's enough for part three. And as always, thank you all so much for watching and listening in, and I'll see you on the next one very soon.